Hi everyone, I'm Associate Professor Lee Hickey. Uh, I'm your host for today, for today's exciting Coffee Science Seminar. Um, I, I'm based here at Coffee. I lead a research team working on plant breeding tools and technologies. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianships of the lands on which we meet today. I pay respect to their ancestors and their descendants who continue um, cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australia and global society. A few housekeeping things to mention. Um, firstly, this seminar is scheduled from 12 until 1 p.m. At the conclusion of the seminar, we will hold a Q&A session. If you have any questions that you would like answered, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. So don't use the chat button, please. Uh, and we will address these questions on the conclusion of this seminar. So today, it's, it's a real pleasure uh, to have a special guest for our science seminar, Alison Bentley completed her PhD at the University of Sydney. And I've known Alison for quite a while now, uh, since her leadership role at NIAB in the UK, uh, leading a lot of the pre-breeding activities on wheat and barley over there. Uh, in particular, Alison is really passionate about training the next generation. Um, and we uh, conducted a workshop together for the next gen wheat breeders in Canada a couple of years ago, which I found uh, a lot of fun and uh, and, and to work with the different um, early career researchers uh, and with Alison doing this. More recently, however, Alison um, was appointed as the director of CIMIT's Global Wheat Program and the CGIR Research Program on Wheat. So this is really exciting to have Alison in this role. Um, the program develops germplasm that is distributed to around 200 cooperators in wheat producing countries worldwide and is responsible for the derived varieties being grown on more than 50% of the spring wheat area in developing countries. So clearly, Simmon has a really important role uh, for global food security. And we're going to hear a lot more about it in Alison's seminar. Um, Alison, it's a pleasure to have you. Many thanks. Uh, many thanks, Lee, for, for the introduction, uh, and I too acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today and pay my respect to their ancestors and their descendants. Uh, it's great to be here to, to share virtually with you some of the work that we're doing in the CIMIT Global Wheat Program. As Lee mentioned, I, I quite recently joined uh, CIMIT in this role, uh, coming up on, on a year now. Uh, and what I want to share today is, is just a snapshot of some of the activities within the program, uh, by no means covering uh, all of the many activities, uh, but just to give you an idea of some of the areas in, in which we are working uh, to better serve smallholder farmers uh, in the global south. So just for you, those of you who aren't uh, familiar with CIMIT, our, our mission is really around amazing wheat science for improved livelihoods. Uh, and we aim to, within the CGIS system of, of agricultural research centers, uh, transform the food systems for affordable, sufficient, and healthy diets within planetary boundaries. So this is really at the core of, of what we aim to deliver through maize and wheat science. As Lee said in the introduction, uh, the, the scope uh, and the global reach of our germplasm has been well documented through a number of past studies. Uh, and what this shows here is the ancestry of uh, material growing throughout the world, uh, showing the role of CGIAR wheat germplasm in our target geographies in Latin America, South Asia, uh, and Africa. Uh, and here we really see a large uh, presence of cement wheat uh, as parents uh, in, in breeding programs, as well as uh, material for direct release. So this really gives you the context of the CIMIT program, uh, aiming to have impact through the delivery of improved germplasm across this quite wide and diverse range of production environments throughout the developing world. Uh, and this germplasm has traditionally been provided from a centralized breeding program based here in, in Mexico. Uh, and this using the shuttle breeding strategy uh, advocated and innovated by, by Norman Borlaug, a shuttles material between central and northern Mexico, uh, allowing intensive selection 
uh, in, in many different environments uh, and using the pressure of these environments to, to make selection decisions uh, and, and to really provide a robust uh, and resilient germplasm base. Uh, and so here in El Batan, uh, as well as in Toluca, we have very intense screening for, for disease resistances. Uh, and in Ciudad Obregón in northern Mexico, we're able to assess material in a range of simulated selection environments, uh, including for water use efficiency, heat tolerance, obviously these being uh, targets of increasing importance. And with the outbreak of EG99, we added an additional shuttle in Enduro in Kenya, uh, which allows us to screen all of the material coming from the program uh, for stem rust, as well as for yellow rust. Uh, again, ensuring this package of traits uh, is really consolidated into our improved germplasm base. As I mentioned, in northern Mexico, we use a set of simulated selection environments uh, to make selections for a wide range of geographies around the world. Uh, and obviously, the ideal is to make selections in each of these environments in order to provide very targeted uh, environment-specific germplasm. But this centralization really allows us to consolidate the, the available resources uh, and use these simulated environments to, to uh, generate the data to inform the selection uh, decisions for each of our, each of our target uh, geographies. So this has proved to be, be very effective in terms of the, the cost uh, per unit input uh, to use these selection environments, which include uh, early late planting to capture heat and drought stress, as well as the use of optimal conditions with, with very finely tuned uh, ir irrigation systems. So in my talk today, as I, as I mentioned, I'm just gonna give a snapshot of some of the current activities uh, within the program. Uh, cover, covering the acceleration of our, of our core breeding program, uh, protection against disease and pests, uh, and finally, some, some new work on, on bridging the adoption and, and varietal turnover gap. So I'll start with accelerating and enhancing our breeding efforts. As I mentioned at the start of the presentation, there is well-documented evidence of the role of improved simit germplasm uh, in global wheat pedigrees. Uh, and many studies have also documented genetic progress over time uh, in simit wheat breeding. Uh, and this is some recent data where we've run an error trial to, to really quantify these genetic gains rather than just using uh, historical performance data. Uh, and this shows in both our optimal environment uh, material shown in the picture on the top left uh, and our stress adapted uh, material shown on the bottom left, the, the rates of genetic gain that we see over time from both these programs. So these are close to 1% per year, which is, is very similar to the analysis of historical uh, genetic gains in, in all of the material produced. So this shows that the programs made genetic progress over time. Uh, and really now we want to focus on, on the future and how we can make these gains uh, even faster uh, or at a more cost effect in a, in a more cost effective means. Uh, and really one of the core, the core parts of the program at the moment is the adoption of rapid generation breeding uh, to reduce cycle time uh, and really focusing on the early generations of the breeding program. So we've con constructed a number of new uh, pieces of infrastructure uh, at our Toluca station with the aim to reduce the breeding cycle time from, from the current uh, of around six years uh, to three years per cycle. Uh, and this is using a, a screenhouse, a semi-controlled environment over about two hectares uh, to rapidly advance the early stages of the breeding program. We're also using genomic selection, which I'll, I'll talk about briefly, uh, to, to implement both the selection of, of lines to progress within the program, uh, and importantly, for the rapid recycling of, of parents into the start of the breeding process, again, to, to, with the aim to, to speed up the breeding process. Uh, we're also using speed breeding, obviously very familiar to, to the audience here, uh, for traits introgression, uh, really focused on race-specific genes and QTLs for disease resistance. Uh, most of our farmers, the farmers that we serve, don't have access to plant protectives. So here the aim is to, as quickly as possible, uh, accumulate uh, known or, or recently discovered uh, genes or QTLs offering disease resistance to make them available as quickly as possible as parents that can enter the breeding pipelines uh, and, and to then be able to use and access them uh, in these accelerated breeding schemes. 
So as I mentioned, this has this has been a, a relatively recent uh, investment in the production of this greenhouse, which you can see in the, the image on the top, uh, as well as speed breeding infrastructure uh, to really underpin uh, this ambition to, to drive the early stages of the breeding program, as well as the augmentation of material uh, for use as parents in, breeding in our breeding pipelines. Uh, this has, has really relied on, on this investment uh, in infrastructure. Uh, and we've now completed uh, the first round of crossing within our greenhouse facility, so this was around one hectare of, of wheat planted in this area, uh, 1500 crosses recently made, uh, with again the aim really to, to use this semi-controlled environment facility uh, to accelerate those early stages of the breeding program. Uh, and really hopefully this image is to, is to capture the scale. Uh, obviously we, we would love to use speed breeding for, for all of this, but at the scale uh, on which we're working, uh, this is this is the facility that we believe will allow us to, to move as quickly as possible uh, without uh, as big an as, as investment as would be required to, to, to create a fully controlled environment for this large scale rapid generation uh, advance. Uh, as I mentioned, we're, we're using the speed breeding facility for, for trait augmentation. Uh, and this is really important in terms of our relationship also with the, the global wheat community, because this really relies on us having access to information uh, and selectable markers, uh, as well as trait targets. So we really need to understand what our trait targets are uh, and then move as quickly as possible to create parents which have these uh, traits captured uh, within them. So this is also relatively recent. The, the optimization is led by one of our wheat breeders, which is Mina Mondal, uh, and she's now create, uh, completed two uh, crossing cycles within the speed breeding facility. Uh, and this, as I said, relies on uh, reliable markers, which are made available to, to the community uh, and really support uh, the objective to, to really use the latest information that's available on the genetic control, particularly of these disease resistances, uh, to allow us to rapidly accumulate these into parents uh, and into our breeding pipelines so they can reach uh, the hands of farmers. Uh, and just an indication of, of our initial targets, uh, which are all mapped to specific product profiles within the, the program serving different regional uh, and market needs. Uh, so as I mentioned, most of these are focused on disease resistances. So, so a lot of work on, on the rust, as, as is expected, uh, many high rust environments, uh, as well as Fusarium head blight and Septoria trichosi, uh, aphid resistance, uh, as well as a couple of non-disease uh, resistance traits. Uh, one of these is a pre-breeding target, really asking, can we, can we introgress through a speed breeding process, uh, haplotypes, uh, from contributed by genetic resources, so crop wild relatives, can we use this speed breeding approach uh, and haplotype, haplotype based selection to create parents with, with novel uh, combinations of um, novel haplotypes from our donor materials and our wild relatives, uh, as well as looking at grain weight uh, in our durum wheat uh, pipeline. Uh, and this is just an indication for the example of green bug or aphid. Uh, really one of the uh, a really increasing disease pressure, not only from the, the aphid damage itself, but also from the virus vectors transmitted by the, the aphids. Uh, and our current aim is to pyramid four loci, which have been detected uh, into a single background using fairly standard marker assisted selection uh, and taking advantage of, of the speed breeding pipeline. So this is work led by uh, another of our wheat breeders, Leo Crespo, with Susanna Dreisegacher in the Molecular Biology Lab, uh, that really looks to take uh, QTLs, loci detected in synthetic wheats primarily, uh, and, to, uh, and the work is now being done to detect these QTLs, create markers, uh, and now the, the challenge is to, to try and pyramid all of these uh, into elite backgrounds uh, and use these for some of the breeding pipelines where we see a real demand from our partners to, to deliver aphid resistance given the increasing frequency uh, and damage caused by, caused by the insects as well as uh, the viruses they transmit. We're also using, in addition to uh, a single, single marker or, or multi-marker uh, assisted selection and trait introgression, genomic selection uh, is now mainstream within the program. 
So since 2016, around five years ago, uh, uh, genomic selection was applied in stage one material. So this is around nine to 10,000 lines in the first year of yield trialing. Uh, and this was the, the point at, at which the genomic selection uh, was applied to make the advancement decision into stage two yield trials, uh, as well as for the recycling uh, of parents into the line development process. Uh, and this is obviously a fairly large undertaking uh, to, to apply uh, genotyping, given we have spring wheat, very short cycle times uh, to apply this for, for 9,000 lines. Uh, and this cycle, uh, we're trying uh, to move this earlier. Obviously, we want to accelerate the breeding process. So the earlier we can move this step, uh, the earlier we can recycle parents, uh, as well as make, uh, make decisions on material to advance uh, through the program. So this year, we're attempting to use genomic selection at the pre-testing stage, where we have uh, small plots only. Uh, so this is double the number of lines as in the stage two yield trialing. So almost 20,000 lines. Uh, attempting this in order to, to add some further acceleration uh, in terms of the recycling of parents uh, into, the, into the breeding pipeline. Uh, and also, I won't go into a lot of detail uh, today, but really looking at how we can more specifically target our breeding material. One of the hallmarks of the CIMIT program has been the wide adaptation of the material developed, but increasingly our partners are requesting material that's more specifically adapted to or optimized for their production environments. So we're doing a lot of work with our partners to really define the target populations of environments that define specific regions or, or specific subsets of, of regions. Uh, and this hopefully will allow us to, to make crosses and progress material that is specifically suited uh, to these production environments. So whilst we aim to keep a wide adaptation, we also aim to produce uh, and disseminate material, uh, which is more uh, adapted to specific contexts uh, and can be tested earlier and more robustly in these environments, thereby providing earlier feedback on the optimization of the breeding process for those specific target environments. Uh, and on the left here, you can see South Asia, which is now uh, being classified into these regions of target populations of environments denoted by the different colors. Uh, and so this really now defines within South Asia the different, spe the specific different uh, target populations of environments. Uh, and we can target our breeding as well as our testing efforts uh, to these specific uh, regional needs uh, rather than providing only uh, widely adapted uh, material, although of course the, the, the ability to be widely adapted is still at the core of the program. Uh, we've also been doing some additional analysis recently to really look at, at what the gains uh, that have been achieved over time, how they break down across each of these target populations of environments. So although previously we had a centralized breeding strategy not targeted at these specific regions, we're asking, can we, can we look at that data and say how well the wide adaptation, uh, the, the centralized breeding um, effort actually delivered genetic gain in each of these regions? Uh, and this will also allow us to quantify the improvement in, in terms of, of specific gains for these target environments by moving to more specifically targeted breeding pipelines, uh, as well as to earlier testing in each of these uh, different target regions. So now I wanted to switch uh, gears slightly and talk about protecting against uh, diseases and pests. Uh, and really this is, this is hugely important to, to our program. Uh, and for many of the farmers that we serve, the, the pathogen resistance package that we provide in our germplasm is the first uh, and often the only line of defense uh, against crop failure or severe damage due to pests and disease pressure. Uh, and the number of pests and diseases that we, that we aim to provide resistance for uh, is, is predominantly the rust. Uh, here you can see a, a variety of rust, as well as increasingly the pressure of insects. I mentioned aphids already, uh, as well as wheat blast, which I'll talk about specifically uh, in a minute. Uh, so I wanted to, to touch on wheat blast because it's an emerging uh, pathogen, which has really uh, accelerated over recent years. Uh, and become one of the focuses of the, the disease package that, that CIMIT material uh, is provide, provided with CIMIT material. 
Uh, and this uh, emerged uh, first in South America and then spread uh, to Bangladesh uh, and much more recently to, to Zambia uh, with quite significant implications for the production of, of wheat, particularly in South Asia, uh, and really causing, uh, posing a significant uh, threat to, to South Asian wheat production. And then obviously moving into, into Zambia, uh, the potential for it to move uh, on wheat in, in Africa is also uh, very real now. Uh, and the study that, that uh, we were part of allowed us to really understand the relationship between the original uh, Brazil wheat infecting isolates uh, and those which were found in both Bangladesh uh, and Zambia. Uh, and I think it's amazing now that the ability to rapidly collect isolates and have them sequenced at the level of the genome. Uh, this really gives us uh, new information very quickly uh, about where these pathogens come from, how they're spreading, in this case, hypothesized with the seed trade, uh, and, and, how the, and then how potentially we can uh, work to control them. Uh, and I wanted to talk about the response to, to wheat blast, which is a relatively recent uh, threat to, to wheat in, in both South America, South Asia, and now Africa. Uh, and much of this work has been supported over a, a relatively long period, time period, by ACR. Uh, and this includes the, the, um, the inception of a precision phenotyping platform. Uh, and we now have two of these in, in Bolivia and Bangladesh. And these, these phenotyping platforms are, are really essential to the work that CIMIT does because it allows us to screen uh, all of our breeding material, uh, as well as discovery panels uh, or material that's, that's uh, close to, to release uh, under high disease pressure. And again, allows us to provide a reliable and resilient uh, set of germplasm to our partners. So the precision phenotyping platforms established for wheat blast were established very quickly with our partners. Uh, in the case here is the platform in Bangladesh, which is, which is located at Bangladesh Wheat and Maize Research Institute in Jashore. Uh, and this uh, is really essential in terms of the ability to screen, you can almost see here, uh, 22 different sets of material uh, for resistance to, to blast under very high disease pressure. Uh, and this is facilitated in a relatively short amount of time, the release of resistant varieties. These are not varieties that were bred with, with the specific intention of resistance to blast, but the availability of these phenotyping platforms uh, allowed the CIMIT team to rapidly screen available material uh, and make available uh, material with resistance uh, based on this field screening. Uh, and further investments uh, are underway to really continue to support this because we want to know more about BLAS uh, and we want to know more about the epidemiology and, and the ability to, to be more targeted in our resistance uh, strategy. Uh, and this shows again in, in Bangladesh, uh, a new facility which is currently being uh, constructed uh, to allow also for seedling and adult plant resistance, because if we want to deliver material more uh, earlier in the breeding process to our partners, uh, we also need to have the ability to really reliably uh, phenotype it for, for key diseases uh, which are impacting uh, in the region. We're also doing a lot of work within the pathology team led by Pawan Singh on, on QTL mapping for blast resistance. Uh, so they've been working in several different populations, uh, and this is an example uh, of one. Uh, and the 2NS uh, translocation uh, is responsible for, for all of the resistance that we, we currently see. Uh, and this is displayed here, although additional QTL of minor effect uh, also detected uh, and contribute to the levels of resistance when 2NS is present. Uh, and this obviously presents uh, this is a good thing to have the presence of this translocation conferring blast resistance, uh, but obviously we want to have access to, to, to more available genetics uh, in order to deploy this in a way which is going to be stable uh, and durable over time. So there was already a marker also in place for this 2NS translocation, uh, and this has been available for, for a long time. Uh, the translocation itself is well known, uh, and really the team uh, again led by Pawan Singh uh, with support of ACR and, and other partners has been looking to develop additional markers both for the 2NS translocation to allow us to really reliably track it, uh, but also uh, additional small effects QCL that can be deployed uh, alongside it. 
Uh, and this is this is work that's ongoing uh, in several panels, really with this aim to, to provide additional durability to the 2NS uh, resistance that we know is currently, currently holding, uh, but is the only source of consistently high blast resistance, uh, whereas all of the other QTLs that have been detected so far uh, show unstable resistance uh, across experiments. So with BLAST, we had uh, the, the detection, the rapid detection of, of a new pathogen, uh, of an existing pathogen in a new location, the ability to screen large amounts of breeding germplasm under high, high disease pressure allowed us to identify material with resistance. This resistance is conferred by a translocation, which was uh, known, but not known to confer blast resistance. Uh, and now really the challenge is how do we deploy this and, and use it uh, along with other, other sources of resistance to provide a more durable uh, solution for farmers facing uh, this, blast, uh, this blast challenge uh, in wheat production. Uh, and very similar for, for the other uh, diseases we work on, uh, as I mentioned, rust resistance is, is a core part of the breeding uh, strategy uh, and has been for, for a long time. I won't go into it in detail here, but this is just a summary uh, of the many different phenotyping uh, platforms that, that we run as a SIMIT program with our partners uh, in different locations to so allow for selection uh, for multiple stresses. Uh, and shown in the stars here are other rust specific uh, screening sites. And you can see there are quite a lot of these because of the significance uh, of rust. Uh, but we also have uh, platforms for screening for septoria, the soil borne diseases, uh, fusarium head blight, uh, as well as for some of the abiotic uh, stresses like uh, drought and heat stress. So, so I can't really state too, too strongly how important these access to this, this global phenotyping uh, platform is in terms of providing a resilient package uh, within our breeding, breeding material that, that allows farmers to, to have confidence uh, in, in the resilience of the material. Uh, and alongside the deployment of resistance, we also at CIMIT, led by Dave Hodson, have a lot of work on rust detection and monitoring. I, I'm sure many of you are aware of the, the constantly changing nature of the rust and, and the challenge of, of evolution uh, of rust pathogens. Uh, and as part of Dave Hudson's work, there's a global rust monitoring system in place with, with many partners. Uh, and this allows for the rapid detection of any new, any new races or any changes in, in the profile of, of varieties. Uh, and this gives an example here showing some recent work on, uh, on the risk that's posed in a certain environment uh, based on meteorological data and, and epidemiological disease models. Uh, and allows for the, the, um, the sending of advisory notes, uh, which, are, which are distributed in, in a specific uh, geography where vulnerability or a risk is, is, is perceived based on the modeling data. Uh, and this allows farmers to have a, a preemptive, um, preemptive information uh, and to, to give that um, early warning. Uh, and so this is really, uh, shown to be very effective, particularly in East Africa. Uh, and this year, the rapid and coordinated response um, resulted in high levels of control of yellow rust, uh, which were detected early in the season and, and really forecast to, to have as potentially uh, devastating uh, impacts on the wheat production. So that really we're, we're looking to, to marry together the detection work, which is really important in terms of understanding really what's happening in the field, uh, along with the deployment of our disease resistance packages uh, to ensure that varieties are the, the first line of defense uh, against these potential uh, epidemics of, of, of some, severe, some severe pathogens. So now just to come to the final part of my, my talk, I wanted to talk uh, again, changing gear onto bridging the adoption and, and turnover gap. Uh, and this isn't really a, a traditional topic uh, that the CIMIT Google Wheat Program ha has focused on, uh, but is really about um, looking at the difference between supply, uh, really 50 years of supplying uh, extremely highly high performing germplasm, uh, and, and matching this with demand, uh, and really asking questions in a different way uh, about how do we achieve the goal of genetic gain in farmers' fields, not just genetic gain from our breeding programs, 
but how do we ensure that this is delivered into farmers' fields and results uh, in improved livelihoods? So the data that's shown here on the left-hand side is the certified seed production uh, in Africa. Uh, and what you can see is a general trend of increasing supply of improved seed. So, so breeding is doing its job. We have an increase in the supply available um, of, of new varieties. Uh, all of the many people working on breeding uh, are ensuring a new supply of, of improved germplasm, which is available to farmers. But I think the important thing to mention is getting the right seed to the right farmers doesn't happen on its own. Uh, and simply addressing the supply side uh, has traditionally not shown to be uh, not shown to be really a way of driving uh, demand. So, so really, this is looking at the the potential for for disconnect, not not across all crops or or not in all scenarios. That just supplying superior varieties doesn't mean that farmers will take them up uh, and grow them, and that that genetics will will actually get onto farm. Uh, in the form, particularly in the context of wheat, of new varieties. So, so this work has been led by the socioeconomics team uh, at CIMIT, and we're now working very closely uh, with them. On, I'm really trying to understand why farmers choose seed in store. Uh, and this is a, a really interesting study led by Peter Rutzat in the team at CIMIT, uh, and it was focused on, on maize, hybrid maize, obviously acknowledging there are many differences between hybrid maize uh, and, and wheat. Uh, but anyway, it sets an, since sets an interesting context for thinking about the demand for new wheat seeds. Uh, and in the case of wheat seeds, really farmers buy it less often because they can save it. So we really do want to understand why would a farmer, a particularly a smallholder farmer, uh, invest in new seed when they can save their, their old seed. So, so this is the link where we're trying to, to get to. Uh, and the study by, led by Peter, uh, which uh, the reference is given here, really asked farmers why, how they choose the, the seed that they buy. So if we look at the left-hand side in terms of the preparation, um, and uh, Peter asked the question of farmers, do you discuss which seed you want to buy? Uh, and only one out of 10 farmers even discusses the seed that they're going to buy. Uh, and only two of 10 farmers feel they have sufficient knowledge uh, before they walk into, a, into an agro dealer and buy, uh, buy seed. So then if we look at the middle column in terms of their attitude, we see that eight out of 10 farmers are 100% certain about the choice of variety they're going to purchase uh, before they walk into the store. Uh, and only two out of 10 have any interest in changing them. Uh, and then in terms of in-store, if you associate with a, with a retail store that you might walk into and see banners saying 50% off this specific brand of chocolate, uh, does this make you change your mind? In the context of, of seed, a uh, very few of the farmers uh, who are surveyed, almost 500, uh, even looked at those store offers in the context of which seed they were going to buy. Uh, and only one in 10 asked for any information. So this really starts to give us some clues about why and how farmers choose specific uh, varieties uh, and, and also gives us some information about uh, really what are effective tools to increase farmers, uh, farmers' likelihood to actually buy a new variety. But, but Peter and, and Jason, who, who ran this study, uh, went one step further than, than just these exit surveys where they asked farmers after they bought seed or before they bought seed, uh, do you know what you want to do? Uh, and they actually set up uh, an actual seed uh, agro-dealer in, in East Africa uh, and used a pre-planned survey and a post-visit uh, post survey to discuss the choice of variety. Uh, and because uh, the previous work had shown that farmers already know what variety they're going to, going to buy before they go into the agro-dealer, they had two treatments here. They had one uh, where there was full stock, 50% full stock, uh, and the other half they had uh, out of stock for the planned variety. Uh, and they knew which, which variety the, the farmer planned to buy because they had run this pre-survey uh, and asked the farmer, which, which variety do you plan to buy? And so for 50% of those farmers, that variety wasn't in stock in this uh, mock store that was created. 
Uh, and then they also considered uh, the, the effect of inflammation and a discount, uh, a price discount on the purchase of seeds. Uh, and what this, uh, what this study found are very interesting results is that variety choice is largely disconnected from the actual traits of a variety. So just having a poster which lists that this variety has flowering time of 45 days, it has a septoria tristici resistance of rating of seven, this has very little influence on the variety choice. So we know from the previous work that most farmers make a very quick decision on seed choice, and this is largely an automatic uh, and predetermined choice. Um, and when the preferred variety is avail available, so in this 50% where full stock was available in the, in the store, 90% of farmers uh, chose that variety which they had said they were going to, to choose. Uh, the price and information can have an influence but had very limited effect uh, and really not as much as you would expect from your maybe your own personal detail experiences. Uh, and this really tells us that strong, strong triggers are really needed to influence the choice uh, and the, the decision to, to pick up a new variety. Uh, so it's not simply about providing a new variety uh, and putting up a poster saying this variety uh, is 10 times better than the old variety. Uh, these don't appear to be, or, and this one is also 10% cheaper. These don't appear to be sufficient enough triggers to, to influence varietal uh, choice. So this uh, really brings us on to, to our plans within our, our new 1CG uh, initiative, which we've designed called Seed Equal, uh, really about changing from a supply side seed system. So saying if we supply, continue to supply good material, uh, it will be taken up. But, but to really look at it from the demand side and say if we can more mechan mechanistically uh, understand the demand for specific uh, varieties, we may be able to get closer to addressing the issue of low uptake uh, and slow varietal turnover, which we know remain even though we the system provides uh, improved material on an annual basis with increasing rates of genetic gain, full disease packages. Uh, so really we wanna to get to the heart of, of this issue. Uh, and this requires us to, to understand really a lot more about how farmers make decisions, how what their preferences are uh, and how they choose seed uh, across all of the cereal seeds, uh, as well as the legumes, the roots, tubers and bananas. Uh, and so there are many information gaps to be addressed, not, not uh, not in, in addition to the stakeholder preference and needs, also uh, the gender components of this, who makes decisions, who accesses inputs, uh, and the decision-making power that, that farmers have around the seed that they, they ultimately choose. Uh, and we really ask, can this understanding provide tangible insight into why varieties choose specific, why farmers choose specific varieties uh, and why they're willing to try new varieties? Uh, and then the, the wider question is, can we actually use this to, to feed back into our breeding, uh, our breeding pipelines uh, and design product profiles that aren't just based on, on what we currently do or the specific characteristics of an environment that can also meet the needs of the consumers in those environments and their preferences. Uh, so this is really aiming to, to really link together that long history of CIMIT a wheat program providing improved germplasm uh, with really tailoring it both to the production environments where it's destined to be grown, uh, as well as to the markets and the farmers that we aim to, to reach. So just to summarize uh, the, the few topics that I've covered today, uh, the first is really about the supply side. Can we accelerate the breeding process, provide improved germplasm at a faster rate, and more targeted to the production environments and the farmers that, that we serve through the program? Can we continue to provide protection against rapidly evolving diseases and pests uh, and accumulate all of these things with the agronomic and, and yield packages uh, that we need? Uh, and then finally, can we actually work on the adoption of new varieties and the farmer preference to, to buy seed of new varieties in order to address varietal turnover and get these new varieties with these packages of traits onto farms uh, even faster. So some final thoughts uh, before I close uh, about delivering wheat for the future. So, so just a reminder that, that wheat 
uh, is a food source pivotal to the alleviation of hunger. Uh, it's eaten by a, a large proportion of, of the global population uh, and is really essential as a food security crop. Uh, Long-term investment in, in plant breeding is obviously needed uh, and underpins this supply side. So supply of diverse, uh, adapted and resilient germplasm. I think we see in the academic sector, uh, UQ uh, among the leaders in this, many innovations and discoveries uh, in breeding, breeding methods are being rapidly, rapidly made. We have uh, a, a never before seen uh, availability of tools uh, that can be deployed in, in breeding. Uh, and really the challenge is to, to equitably accumulate and deploy these uh, within our breeding programs. Uh, as I've shown from the, the disease example, uh, international coordination and sharing of expertise uh, is really essential to prevent epidemics uh, in our cropping systems uh, and to ensure the continual supply of resilient germplasm. Uh, as I've mentioned also, really, I, I see a huge opportunity to, to more systematically understand demand uh, and farmer preference for new varieties. Uh, and this is a way in which we can address the gap that does exist uh, in many of our contexts between breeding, uh, adoption and varietal turnover. So really matching up our supply with a, a tangible understanding of, of demand and the drivers of demand. Uh, and then finally, a, a practical consideration that, that plant breeding doesn't stop. Uh, so we need to do all of this in, in, on a moving vehicle uh, and evolve the programs uh, within the practical realities of a 365 day plus uh, per year operation. So this, uh, these are real time uh, improvements that we need to make uh, within functioning breeding programs. So I'll end there and you can find out more about the CIMIC Global Wheat Program, uh, as well as all of our donors uh, and partners at these links here. Uh, and there's also a link to our new Accelerating Genetic Gains in Wheat Program, which is really supporting uh, much of the, the early stages of the breeding pipeline uh, and our trait augmentation work. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the invitation uh, to present. Uh, and I'll hand over to you, Lee, for the question and answer session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alison. Uh, that was a wonderful talk and an overview of the CIMIT program, um, some of the new initiatives that are being taken on and new technologies, um, and of course, some of the big challenges that lie ahead. So thank you so much. Um, we have some questions rolling in. Um, so just to, to kick to kick things off, um, uh, actually, I, I was wondering um, about CRISPR and genome editing. Um, you know, you talked a bit about other technologies like genomic prediction. Um, do you see CRISPR as a part of the toolkit for the future for wheat improvement? Yeah, thanks for the question, Lee. I think the precision genetic technology space is, is really exciting. I, I guess the question we ask is in 10 years, do we expect to see gene edited uh, crops in the field? I, I think probably the answer for most of us is, is yes. Uh, and really, do, does the, do we want to see these also in, in the developing world? Uh, yes. So I think the technology has huge potential uh, for, for application, much like the trait, trait augmentation, also novel traits. Um, so, so really exciting space and, and really excited to see how we can take that, what direction we can take that in, in for we, with the reality that this, this will be available to, to consumers uh, and farmers in, in other parts of the world. So we need to make sure it's also available to, to smallholder farmers. Uh, definitely. Um, our question here from Barbara Williams about um, the study that you showed on the analysis of farmers and how they choose their variety. Um, she was wondering um, if they know what variety they want before they go into the store, uh, was any work done to find out how they made that decision before they went into the store? Yeah, super interesting question, Barbara. I think you can really drill down into this. Uh, and, and that's really what the, the work aims to do now, to really go into the household setting and say, like, OK, like, uh, how many of you are sitting at the table the night before you go to buy the seed? Uh, and who's really making the decision? And what's the dynamics of that decision? What are the drivers? Are the drivers only about money? Are the, are the drivers really 
uh, about any of the gender specific traits are, and yes, yeah, so I think that there's a huge field of investigation there that's really focused on the, the social, socioeconomic components of, of that. Uh, and that's really where the, the team is moving now to go, okay, right, how are those decisions come, come to? Because we know you arrive having already made the decision. Um, and, and really to go backwards from that and say, okay, what are the drivers of those decisions? And then if the driver is just resources, is the answer more resources? You know, then you also have to have to unpick that that driver um, as well. So so a lot of work still to be done there, but but very interesting in terms of the triggers uh, and the drivers of those pre-made decisions. Thanks, Alison. Um, a question here from Craig Hardner, and, and this kind of aligns with uh, some of my uh, thoughts too around product profiles, but um, he's asking, um, when trying to capture grower preferences, how do you try and accommodate different perspectives along the value chain, and what may occur in the future when new varieties are released? Yeah, again, great, great question, and something where really I, I guess struggling is maybe not the right word to it to admit in this forum, but really trying to get your head around because, you know, a, a wheat crop is not a banana, you know, a banana is the finished product, whereas the, the wheat grain is is really the starting product that, that goes into a, a hugely complex kind of processing chain. Um, and even within a geographical region, so we're trying to develop these these market segmentation uh, concepts on a on a single region, but if you take South Asia or even you take India, I mean this is a hugely diverse um, space in terms of what that wheat will actually be be used for uh, and who the end user of it is. Um, so so really we we have a new initiative as part of the One CG, which will spend the next three years trying to break this down into into those component parts and then give the breeders a. A, a kind of goal because we also need to kind of work this into a biological context what the market needs and what biology and plant breeding can actually achieve and, and make these these meet in the middle great thanks Alison um a a question here from Tony Fisher um and he's he's asking um he's actually uh, brought up some of the studies um that were done on a uh, high throughput phenotyping of um, the canopy around canopy temperature and NDVI in stage one and two yield trials. And I, I guess it's quite promising. He, he's pointing out that, that, that these traits can be assayed pretty quickly and efficiently, um, as efficiently perhaps as genomic selection. Um, is that work sort of being integrated into the program? Definitely. Thanks for the question, uh, Tony. Uh, and obviously, I didn't have time to, to cover all of the physiological work that, that's also going on and, and having a big impact, particularly on the, the heat and drought stresses and, and really understanding some of the physiological drivers. So there has been a lot of work to, to use high throughput phenotyping. And I think the exciting point is when we can combine that phenotyping, high throughput phenomics, uh, with the genomic selection uh, and that's work underway to really try and not only use the phenomics, not only use the genomics, but put them together, use the pedigree, use all of the available information uh, and really harness the power of all of that uh, to make selection and recycling uh, decisions, as well as to understand more about the, the physiology and the response to, to the many stresses that, that we face in many of our production environments. Thanks, Alison. Um, I have a question here from Samir Alamad, um, and he's just wondering whether Simit, as part of their global programs, have any workshops uh, with farmers or meetings to raise awareness of, of I guess, plant varieties. Um, uh, is this part of Simit's role, or, or do, do Simit work with local partners in this sort of space? Yeah, the seed, the, yeah, and I probably oversimplified the, the seed question because this is very much the, the partnership with the national programs and the release through the, through the country uh, registration system. Um, but really our aim in this new seed equal initiative uh, is to really look at this on-farm testing uh, and dissemination network that exists. Uh, and this is quite well established in, in many places uh, and run by, by partners to, to disseminate and, and distribute varieties. 
but really look at can we take a more data driven uh, approach to this can we harness the power of the data that's generated over over 50 different countries rather than take, just taking one country's data how can we actually capture capture data across multiple countries and then again use it to feed back into the into the breeding process in, in, and gather as much information as possible uh, to target the breeding effort to those farmer preferences that we see in, in on farm trials and, and in the dissemination work but that that work is really done by by partners in in country who are responsible and and have the role in in terms of getting the seeds uh, through the seed system, but really looking to support that uh, activity to, to feed data back into the breeding uh, optimization. Great, thanks, Alison. Um, you can see there's a lot of people really tuning in around uh, the country. And, and the next question comes from John Dixon. Um, and uh, he, he's, and I'm, I'm echoing his, um, his thoughts too, really well, well done to sort of demonstrate that that 1% uh, genetic improvement is, is, is holding up, but it's really nice. And his first question is, um, uh, by 2030, what proportion of improved wheat germplasm will be directed towards environments with poorly funded NARS, so not India or China? Um, did you have any comments about this? Sorry, Lee, what was, the question was, what proportion of the material or the funding? Of, of, the, material? Of the improved germplasm by 2030. Is, by is a large portion of the material sort of headed in that direction to the, to service those areas? Yeah, I guess there are two there are two answers to that that question, John. Um, and the first is that for those countries where there, there is advanced uh, breeding programs that exist, India, Ethiopia are very highly skilled breeders um, really ready to take um, material into those domestic programs. We're asking the question, okay, can we provide material from our program earlier so it suits your needs uh, in terms of what diversity you need, what trait packages you need. So we envisage that, that with those, um, those programs, we'll actually start to move, move uh, upstream in the breeding process uh, and provide material which is, is less of a finished product. So it's more of an improved population uh, and then is available to, to go into those, those breeding programs, which are quite well developed. But at the same time, the second part of the answer is that we, we realize the reality is that many countries, particularly without funded uh, agricultural research uh, systems, still need to have access to material that can be tested uh, and released uh, as direct products. So we would continue to, to maintain that, that global mandate and the provision of products essentially to those to those countries uh, and to those regions where that demand exists. So I think it's really about a, a two-tier strategy. One is where, where you have um, really a demand for populations, improved populations that can go into breeding programs, those will be provided, but also where there exists a, a demand for uh, near products, then those will also be provided uh, by the program just at different different stages of the breeding process. And, and, and secondly, uh, John uh, wanted to point out or highlight that, that ACR has a great project in South Asia on behavioral science um, and adoption decisions. And um, is there any plans uh, going forward to look at new behavioral sort of insights uh, in terms of science um, around market research? On farmer decisions for similar? Certainly, certainly. And that's a that's a really uh, interesting avenue for, for understanding these drivers as the previous question, these drivers of that decision. I know what seed I'm gonna buy. And then we have to go, okay, yep, how did you make that decision? And how would you change change that decision? What are you, what are the drivers? Uh, and I think um, some of the, the new work that we're hoping to do in, in Bangladesh will, will be getting towards working with some of the experts in that space to, to understand that additional layer of information about how behaviors really, really drive the, the choices and the preferences. Uh, and then how as breeders, you can kind of, again, bring that back to the biological realities of, okay, how would we use that information to provide better varieties or better packages of agronomics uh, or better, as Samir's question, better ways to disseminate or um, share those varieties uh, with farmers. Great. Well, thanks so much, Alison. I, I think we've got to stop it there with the questions. Mm -hmm. There's a few we didn't quite get to, but um, 
Uh, thanks so much for joining. I understand it's quite late uh, in Mexico, so we really appreciate you staying up and, and giving us um, your insights about the program. Thanks so much. Um, thanks a lot for having me, Lee. Thanks, everyone. And, and lastly, before we go, I, I just want to highlight uh, the next Coffee Science Seminar uh, will be held on October the 19th, and it'll be a pleasure to have uh, Peter Crisp join us. Um, Peter's an early career researcher. Uh, he's a DECRA fellow uh, here in Australia, and he's doing some really exciting stuff on the epigenome and how we can harness the, the epigenome for crop improvement. So uh, please tune in, and if you're after more details, um, please check out the Coffee website uh, for the seminar details. Uh, thank you very much. See you, everyone.